Welcome to Empowered Learning. This is the second video in the video series for review of sequences and their use in calculus. So in the part one video, uh, we went over what a sequence was and we went over several examples of different types of sequences that we um, either reviewed or got exposed to. Um, we put those in two main categories, um, either sequences that are recursive, that means that we have um, a few predefined terms and then all the other terms in the sequence um, are kind of based off of the previous ones, or we had what's called general sequences to where um, in that case, we just had a way that we could express the list of all the numbers as just an algebraic function and we didn't have any predefined terms. So in this part two video, what we're going to do is go over um, basic definitions and basic facts um, about sequences that we need to know. And remember, um, we want to keep this in mind, the, the whole point of studying this concept um, in the area of calculus is that eventually we want to be able to take these sequences and somehow be able to um, use them to form polynomial uh, function equivalents or, or, or good approximations uh, or good estimates for those functions that we were trying to take antiderivatives of uh, that do not have um, non that do not have elementary function antiderivatives, meaning that uh, we can't get an answer to it by using uh, the methods that you currently study in a, a calculus one or calculus two course or a calculus A or calculus B course. So uh, we're going to go over um, all these definitions and basic facts um, in this video. Um, I'll try to keep it as simple as possible because it is a lot of um, you know little things that we need to know. And then in the part three video, we'll actually take the time to go over some um, examples from scratch, okay? So uh, what follows is a series of definitions, basic facts, and examples illustrating some of um, the definitions or facts about sequences, okay? Um, the order in which the definitions and basic facts are presented are in a logical order so that each subsequent definition and or fact is built off of the previous definition or facts. So I've kind of ordered these in a way uh, to where one kind of feeds into the other. So our first definition, the limit of a sequence. Okay. Um, before we talk about this, I just want to remind you that when we talk about the limit of some function in calculus, um, we need to think about behavior because that's essentially what a limit is. Limit just means behavior. So anytime you read the word limit um, in a calculus course, just think, hey, we're trying to study the behavior of this certain thing that we're talking about. And in this case, we are trying to study the behavior of a function whose sequence, uh, sorry, uh, I'll say that again. <laughs> we're trying to study the behavior of a function whose domain is a subset of the natural numbers, okay? So I have a precise definition and a less precise definition. I'm going to start off with the less precise one first. Uh, a sequence, and of course, this is one of the ways that we denote that, um, has a limit, which is some real number L, if we can make the terms of this particular sequence here as close to um, this real number L as we like, by letting n get sufficiently large. And normally when we say that, we would just say n approaches infinity. So we denote this limit as the limit or behavior of this function as n approaches infinity is um, equals this real number, or we express it this way, okay? Now, note here that if the limit of a sequence exists, then the sequence is said to be convergent, okay? And so that's an important thing to understand. Um, when, you, when you look at this limit here, what you're really saying, if you look at it closely, you're saying that the behavior of this function as n approaches infinity is 
approaching or as we like to say converging upon a specific number and that specific number is going to be L okay and of course because of that fact again if the limit of a sequence exists then the sequence is said to be converging or it looks like it's approaching some number if it doesn't look like is approaching a specific number then we call it divergent or divergent uh, depending upon how you want to say that and normally what ends up happening is that either your uh, your limit exists which means that your limits are going to approach a real number or you're going to have something like negative infinity positive infinity or you have something strange to where the limit from the left and the limit from the right aren't the same so you'll get a does not exist case okay uh, more than likely you'll be dealing with these two um, if it's not a real number okay now the other thing that i've drawn here that i want you to pay close attention to is that notice that i have drawn um, the profile of a sequence here okay and of course if i was to um, draw the corresponding um, continuous time or i guess a continuous function that went along with this it would look something like this okay but because the sequence is just a function whose domain is the set of natural numbers I can't draw a sequence to look like that that uh, brown function that I just um, colored in okay so what you see in brown here is actually a um, a continuous time function and what you see in the dots is the corresponding sequence that acts um, in the same kind of way as um, our our continuous function Okay, and so I'm mentioning that now because we're going to have a basic fact uh, that comes up later um, where we talk about this. And of course, when we talk about it, we'll kind of see it and say, all right, we already know that and we'll move on. OK. All right. So this is the uh, less precise definition of what a limit of a sequence is. So this definition 1B, I'm saying the same thing but I'm using the uh, what's called the epsilon delta definition of um, a limit to be able to do it. Okay? And so this is like the more precise, formal, um, if you're you know, writing fancy proofs kind of way of doing it. Okay? Um, depending upon how your calculus courses are, are ran, uh, you may or may not go over the epsilon delta definitions. So I won't spend too much time on it, but um, I at least want to review it. So um, for this more precise definition, if we have a sequence um, that has a limit L, then that means for every epsilon, and you can think of that epsilon as a Y value tolerance level, okay? So for every um, Y value tolerance level above or below this number L here, there's going to exist um, a corresponding number N and you can say that this n is just a specific x value where um, if our little n's, which is acting like the x values for our sequence, if it gets above this number here, then the corresponding um, y values, in other words, um, how close am I to this y value l? Well, I'm going to be within epsilon for it, okay? So let's say if L was 1 and my epsilon was 0.5, then what I'm saying here is that there uh, epsilon, sorry, L plus epsilon will be 1.5 and L minus epsilon will be 0.5. So if I'm above some number uh, big N here, then that means that, um, the, that the corresponding Y values here are going to be somewhere in between 0.5 and 1.5 okay so that's uh, the main idea behind all that and so of course uh, we denote this limit as uh, of course the limit of the sequence as n approach infinity equals l uh, same as it was before and here this is just a uh, graphical depiction of what's going on um, of course if we had some number um, a sub n plus one or a sub n plus two and you see how it gets within 
this y value tolerance level and so these numbers are getting closer and closer to l uh, this is what it looks like if we kind of stretch it out and look at it um, horizontally speaking and so again if i was to uh, come here in brown again this would be the corresponding continuous time function oops that would go along with that um, not drawing that exactly but you kind of see the idea and beyond this number n here all these uh, sequence um, values or sequence points are within um, l plus and l minus epsilon okay all right so moving on here um, the first basic fact um, and this is uh, determining um, limit of a sequence f of n when f of n has a corresponding function f of x uh, to compare it with. And so this is what I've been doing when I've been drawing in the function here. And so essentially what this theorem says is that uh, if the behavior of my continuous time, sorry, or my con uh, continuous function f of x is converging or approaching some number l as x approaches infinity and i know that um, this function whenever i reduce its domain to just the natural numbers it actually matches the sequence that i need to you know look at and um, evaluate or study then i know that the limit of the corresponding sequence which I know is going to act like the continuous time function is also going to approach L as well. Okay. And so you can see it here clearly that if my continuous function is approaching Y equals L, then of course the sequence, which is just um, the dots everywhere where I have or points, wherever I have natural numbers is also going to act the same way and approach L. Okay. And so we say here that the limit of the sequence F of N which is going to be a subset of my continuous function f of x follows the behavior of uh, the function f of x, okay? So f of n just basically follows the behavior of f of x, where f of x is your continuous function, f of n is your sequence, okay? All right, so definition two. special sequences that diverge to infinity. So um, if you remember here, we have, uh, we just got through talking about cases where, um, sorry, let me go back up here. Yeah, we just got through talking about cases here where um, if we have a sequence that kind of follows the behavior of a, a continuous function, then of course the limit of the sequence would be going to the same value as the limit of the um, continuous function. And of course that also uh, follows suit if we have a continuous function, if we took the limit of that, um, if it converged, then that means that the corresponding um, sequence that acts in the same way would, uh, would um, converge, okay? Now, what this also means is that if we have a, a particular continuous function that diverges, or the, the limit of that function as, in, as x approaches infinity goes to plus or minus infinity, then the same thing is going to happen for the corresponding sequence that acts in the same way, okay? And so that's what definition two is about, okay? And so here, uh, Basically, what this says is that if we have a sequence, um, a function whose um, domain is a subset of natural numbers, as n approaches infinity, if it goes to infinity, that means for every positive uh, number m, there is going to exist at least um, one integer n such that if, and you can kind of look at this as the x values, if my x values get beyond this number here, then the corresponding y value, uh, a sub n, will get beyond that. And so that just means that it just keeps growing and growing, getting bigger and bigger, okay? Now, basic fact number two. 
basic fact number two is just trying to marry the concepts of your basic limit laws that you learned in your first year calculus course with how they work with sequences okay so this is nothing really new um, it's just saying that whenever you study this in first year calculus you were dealing with functions that were um, continuous so now what we're doing is we're dealing with functions um, whose domain is just a, a subset of the natural numbers so it's not necessarily continuous but what we're saying is that uh, since the behavior of these functions that we're going to be considering um, that are sequences are going to act very similar to their continuous function counterparts, then that means all the limit laws apply to them as well. Okay, And so that is what all of, all of this information here is for. So it's, uh, if you're familiar with limits from a first year calculus course, it's the same exact thing. Okay. All right, so we're going to go ahead and move on here. So basic fact number three, uh, squeeze theorem. So in a first year calculus course, you also study the squeeze theorem. And this is um, a technique that we use uh, to be able to find out what the limit of a particular function is um, whenever we don't want to or it's real difficult to actually find the limit of the actual function itself. But we find... Um, related functions to it such that the the let's say two other functions that we find kind of sandwich in or squeeze in uh, the function that we really want to find the limit for um, at a particular value of X of course in this case it would be a particular value of n and so what we're saying here is that um, in this case if we have some sequence that we want to figure out the limit for or put another way um, we want to figure out if a particular sequence converges or not because that's kind of the main thing with sequences that we want to know then we have these related functions a sub n and c sub n that kind of sandwich or squeeze in uh, that particular uh, sequence b sub n as it approaches infinity okay so if we have uh, this case here where we have uh, a sub n and c sub n that squeeze in b sub n for all values of n, or all natural numbers beyond this particular amount. And we know that the limit of these two related functions as n approaches infinity are the same number. Then that means by the squeeze theorem, uh, the behavior of this sequence as n approaches infinity has to act the same way. Okay. And so as an example here, um, let's say we wanted to figure out if this particular sequence um, converges or not. Well, what we'll do is we see that we have this related function, a, a sub n and c sub n, that kind of squeeze in these two, okay? And so we know that for any value of n, we know that um, n plus one divided by n will always be smaller than this. And we know that n plus 5 divided by n will always be larger than the n plus 3 divided by n, okay? So here, since we know that, we say, all right, well, let's look at a sub n and c sub n and see what their limits are as n approaches infinity. Or put another way, let's see if we keep on listing numbers out for a sub n and c sub n, will they converge upon some specific number, okay? And of course, and when we evaluate the limit, you see that they both um, have a limit of one or both of those sequences converge upon some number one. So what that means is that um, at the end of the day, this B sub n is also going to do the same thing. Okay. Now, here I also um, get a little bit more descriptive here to show you um, what the actual sequences of A sub n, B sub n, and C sub n look like. And so I've done that just to kind of prove to you that a sub n is going to be less than or equal to b sub n, which is less than or equal to c sub n. Okay, so you can actually you know see that by looking at these functions here, because two is less than four, which is less than six. Three halves is less than five halves, which is less than seven halves, so on and so forth. Okay. 
So because of that, those two things um, actually showing or that a sub n is less than or equal to b sub n, which is less than or equal to c sub n, and that the limits of the a sub n and c sub n as n approaches infinity both approach the same number, then that means that the limit of b sub n is also going to approach that same number as n approaches infinity. Okay. So that is how we use the squeeze theorem um, with sequences. Now, um, going to do some other examples here where you kind of see the squeeze theorem being used. So um, we want to know, uh, does the sequence a sub n, um, which is characterized by n factorial divided by n raised to the n converge or not? Okay. And so for this one, uh, this is more of a complicated example, but I did want to show it just so that you kind of understand um, a situation where the squeeze theorem is really, really useful. Okay. So what I've done here is I've started to list out just um, what these numbers in the sequence are going to look like here. And so the idea is that um, when I list out these numbers, um, I need to know how they're behaving. And so that's why I'm purposely listing them out this way instead of just getting the number itself. And so um, one of the things that, that we see here is that if I keep on listing out uh, the numbers for a sub n, if I do n factorial in the numerator and n raised to the n in the denominator, notice that we have um, a situation where I could factor out a one divided by n. So in other words, I could single like this n out by itself and just say, hey, I have this factor here. Okay. Now, what ends up being left, all this business here, what ends up being left there is a situation where if you start plugging in, let's say, uh, depending upon what value of n you want, you're going to have um, 2 times 3 times 4 all the way to n here. And of course, um, down in the denominator, you're going to have you know n of these. And so if we match up to this, we know that 2 divided by n, 3 divided by n, 4 divided by n. Um, of course, if n is getting large, 2 divided by n is going to be a number less than 1. Um, 3 divided by n is going to be a number less than 1. 4 divided by n is going to be a number less than 1, so on and so forth. And at most here, you'll have n divided by n, which is going to be 1. But if we multiply all these numbers here that are less than 1 by a number that's equal to 1, we're still going to have uh, some numbers here that are uh, this um, product here is still going to be less than one. And so no matter what, we're going to have um, something here that's going to be at, at the best slightly less than one times this one over n here. Okay. So why is that important? Okay. Well, we know that on the high end, the best that we can do as far as getting to a number is that uh, we'll get to one over n, whatever that is. Okay, so we're using we're using that, and we're saying that n factorial divided by n raised to the n is not going to uh, get above one divided by n. On the low end, if n goes to infinity, we know that one divided by n uh, will be going to zero. Okay. And so that is what you're seeing. Uh, well, that's what you're seeing me use here. Okay. So if this is true, then I know that if I take the limit of each of these, if I take the limit of each of these uh, expressions here, then um, I know that here, limit of zero is zero. Limit of a sub n as n approaches infinity is going to be something limit of one over n as n approaches infinity is going to be something as well. And so what I would need to do is find out what the limit of these two are. Of course, uh, the limit of zero is zero and the limit of one over n as n approaches infinity is also zero. So because of that, that means that the limit of this 
this uh, sequence in the middle, which is essentially going to be this one, will also have to follow suit. So again, this is just a, a way for me to be able to uh, show that this particular sequence will converge and it'll converge to zero, um, but we do it by the squeeze step. Okay, so let's move on to basic fact number four. So basic fact number four deals with convergence of some sequence um, follows the convergence of the absolute value of that sequence when the absolute value of the sequence converges to zero. Okay, so basically what this means is, is that let's say we have some sequence um, a sub n. And let's say this sequence a sub n um, has some type of uh, alternating sign thing going on with it, where, uh, of course, when we list out the numbers, we may, may have a number that's negative and it's positive and it's negative and it's positive and it just keeps on going. Okay. So, of course, the absolute value of this particular sequence would just be the same numbers, but of course, everything would be positive at that point. So, all these numbers here uh, would essentially be positive. So the idea is that if I was to study the behavior of the absolute value of this sequence and it went to zero, then it means that the corresponding sequence with all the change in signs, um, the limit of that would also go to zero as it approaches infinity. Okay. So, um, this is a way for us to, to basically say, hey, whenever I have a sequence that has uh, these alternating signs in between um, each term, um, I could figure out the behavior of what that particular sequence is going to do just by kind of stripping out um, the, the alternating sign part of it and just looking at the, the actual numbers in the sequence itself to see how does it behave. Okay. All right. So um, one example that we can look here to see, uh, just to actually see how this works with this basic fact number four, is we're going to consider this uh, what we call an alternating sequence here. And of course, this uh, negative one raised to the n plus one is going to create the um, alternating sign thing, where, um, of course, if we plugged in a one here, uh, we would get negative one raised to two, which would be a positive one. So we would have positive number, negative number, positive number, negative number um, as a result of that. So here, what we see is that if we look at this sequence um, and we look at the absolute value of it, what we've basically done is stripped away this um, alternating part to it. And so we're just going to look at the behavior of this function on its own. And uh, we want to see, does it converge or not? Well, um, using basic fact four, of course, we're stripping away the, the alternating sign thing. Um, if you remember, uh, basic fact number one said that the behavior of a sequence uh, should follow the behavior of the corresponding continuous function. And so here we know that um, natural log of n divided by n will have the same profile and behave the same way as natural log of x divided by x. So we just need to take the limit of natural log of x divided by x, um, where x is considered to be, um, you know, a real number. And in this case, uh, the, to be specific, since uh, the domain of natural log is all values of x greater than zero, is any real number greater than zero. Whereas here, uh, we're only considering n to be uh, natural numbers that are one and higher. So like one, two, three, four, five, six, where here in this case, we're considering it to be any real number, whether it's decimal, irrational, whatever, as long as it is a positive one, okay? So with that being said, we just need to evaluate the limit of natural log of x divided by x as x approaches infinity. So we start that process off here. And uh, since if we plug in infinity both into x here and here, we get an infinity over infinity case. We know from first year calculus that we can use Le Hopital's rule. 
So we state that by putting the H on top of the equal sign and then taking the derivative of the numerator and denominator separately, um, evaluating the limit again, and we see that that eventually goes to zero. Okay. So what this tells us is that the behavior of um, this particular uh, continuous function, natural log of x divided by x, as x approaches infinity, is going to go to zero. And of course, uh, we could have easily uh, figure that out because the natural log function grows much slower than the function y equals x. So um, to put it in pre-cal terms, um, this particular uh, quotient is bottom heavy. Okay. So because of that, um, we know since the behavior of the continuous function goes to zero as x approaches infinity, um, the behavior of this corresponding sequence will follow suit. And that is what um, we are saying here, that from base effect one, since that goes to zero, then of course, uh, the limit of this will go to zero as well, okay? And because of that, we also know that since the limit exists, meaning that it equals a real number, that this particular sequence will converge upon some number, okay? And in this case, uh, that number would actually be zero. So we would have a situation where we have a sequence um, that kind of starts off with some number and it bounces up and down. And as it continues to go, eventually it gets to the point to where, you know, it's going to zero. So that's kind of what that particular uh, sequence looks like. So basic fact number five um, is our way of dealing with how to take the limit of uh, a sequence where that sequence is actually um, a composite sequence or a composition sequence, okay? So if you remember in uh, pre-calculus, uh, we talked about the concept of a composition function where if you had a function g of x stuffed into another function f of x, um, of course, uh, it is also expressed this way if we use the notation. Um, and in your first year calculus course, uh, one of the things that you talked about is how to take the limit of a composition function. Okay. Well, of course, sequences are functions. They're just functions whose domain is, is a subset of the natural numbers. So naturally taking the limit of a composition function, um, or a composition sequence, um, is going to follow the same kind of rules as taking the limit of a normal composition function. Okay. So uh, when I say using convergent series to find the limit of converging continuous functions, that's another way of putting it. But essentially, um, we're figuring out how to take the limit of a composition function, and that function just so happens to be a sequence. So we see here if we have some sequence a sub n, and the behavior of it is such that um, if we keep out listing the numbers, it will converge upon some number L. Nice formal way to say that is the limit of the sequence as n approaches infinity is L. And we have some function f of x um, that is a real number value function that is continuous at this, at some um, x value L. Then we know that the limit of the composition function of f of a sub n so that means we're taking this a sub n function and we are stuffing it in to act like the variable of the outside f of x function. And so what that makes this is really just a uh, sequence. And of course, um, if the limit of a sub n as n approaches infinity goes to L, then that means that the limit of f of a sub n um, as n approaches infinity is going to go to f of whatever that value l is, okay? And so um, here I put this note, my sequence a sub n is used as another way to express x in this function, or uh, put another way, uh, this is just going to be the inside function, okay? Now, let's see some examples on how that is used. So for this first example, we want to um, evaluate the behavior of this sequence cosine of two divided by n. 
where here the a sub n is considered 2 divided by n and my f of x function is cosine of x. Okay, So you see how we've taken this 2 divided by n and we've stuffed it into x there. Okay, So if we let a sub n equal 2 divided by n and we take the limit of 2 divided by n as n approaches infinity, of course that goes to 0. Okay, And so now we look at our function, um, our outside function f of x, which is cosine of x, and we also note that the behavior of our sequence, which is going to essentially be our inside function, goes to zero. Okay, So therefore, by basic fact number five, which is what we just got through studying up here, okay? so this is basically what basic fact five says, um, provided that our a sub n um, is a sequence whose limit as n approaches infinity goes to L, and um, our function f is defined at L. So if we have that, then we can essentially say here that the limit of cosine of 2 divided by n as n approaches infinity is going to be the same as cosine of L. And of course, since L was 0, then that means that um, this sequence f of a sub n will approach 1 as n approaches infinity. So that's uh, the main idea here. Okay. Um, in this sentence, when I said, therefore, basic fact number 5, and I started listing all this stuff, I was just kind of collecting everything together so that I could use it here. Okay. But at the end of the day, um, once once I get to this point here, I really could just jump straight to here and just give what the answer is going to be. Okay. All right. Another example is let's find out the behavior of this particular sequence n times sine of um, one divided by n. Okay. And so one of the things that we note here is that we could express um, the sequence n times sine of 1 divided by n as sine of 1 divided by n divided by 1 divided by n. Okay, And so a part of the motivation for this is um, if you remember in your first year calculus course you dealt with something that looked like this uh, sine of x over x and you learned that the limit of sine of x over x as x approaches in sorry, x approaches zero is equal to one. So that's kind of the motivation behind uh, rewriting it this way, okay? Now, notice here, x is approaching zero, okay? And here we have n approaches infinity. But if you think about it, um, as n approaches infinity, this also tells us that one over n, since n is going to be infinity, is going to approach zero. So, uh, here, if I thought of this x as just 1 over infinity, 1 over infinity, one sorry, um, this x is 1 over n, and 1 over n here, and 1 over n here, you see that it kind of uh, fits the same profile, okay? But uh, we're not going to, for lack of a better way of put it, we're not going to cheat and rewrite it that way. Um, we're actually going to do it using uh, basic this basic fact number 5 here, okay? So uh, we know that we can express our sequence this way, and it follows that sine of 1 divided by x and 1 divided by x are corresponding functions um, that are continuous for values of x uh, greater than or equal to 0. And I'm just saying greater than or equal to 0 since we are trying to go to more positive values of n, so we're not really concerned about the fact of x being negative. Okay. And uh, we know that these two functions are the corresponding functions for these two, and that the sequences 1 divided by n and sine of 1 divided by n are going to follow the same kind of behavior as sine of 1 divided by x and 1 divided by x respectively. Okay, So we want to essentially evaluate the limit of sine of 1 divided by x divided by 1 divided by x, okay? Because however this continuous function is going to act, the 
corresponding sequence here, which is what we really want to know is going to follow suit. So uh, again, we see that if I plug in infinity here for x here and here, I'm going to get a zero divided by zero case, which tells me I can use L'Hopital's rule. And uh, from that, I'll take the derivative of the numerator and denominator separately. I see that these factors here reduce to one, and all I have left is cosine of one over x. And of course, from here, um, we know um, really from basic fact number four, um, but I'm going to use uh, first year calculus to do this. Uh, we know that this limit here um, whenever we have limit of a composition function and we know that of course here if I plugged in infinity this is um, that's going to go towards some real number then of course what we can do here is slide the limit operator on the inside of this composition function to where we're just evaluating the limit of the um, inside function and that's essentially what we have here and of course, we know all this goes to zero. And of course, cosine of zero is one. So what this tells us is that the behavior of this function sine of one divided by x divided by one divided by x, um, or put another way, the behavior of the function x times sine of one divided by x, it is going to be approaching um, one as X approaches infinity. So it follows that since this, the corresponding sequence has the same behavior as a continuous function, that the behavior of the corresponding sequence um, also is going to go to one as in approaches infinity, okay? And so uh, that is another example of how we use a basic fact number five. And remember, basic fact number five is essentially just saying, how do we take the limit of a composition function where the limit of the inside function, which is the actual sequence, um, is going to uh, going to be some real number? In other words, the limit exists. OK. All right. So let's look at basic fact number six. So basic fact number six just gives us a formal way of saying for a geometric sequence. Um, what values of R are going to allow this sequence to converge versus which ones are going to allow it to diverge, okay? And remember, sequence uh, sequences converging just means that if I keep on listing those numbers out, um, the more numbers I list, the more I see that uh, the end of that list is going to approach some number. Even though it may not necessarily get there, um, it will approach it. When it diverges, that means that um, as I list the numbers, they're either going to get infinitely big uh, up to, let's say, positive infinity or infinitely small down to negative infinity. Okay, Or we have some strange thing going on uh, such that no matter what, um, I it's not going to converge upon you know, some number. Okay, And that's when the limit will be like a D in E case or does not exist. So in short, um, if you remember for geometric sequences as long as our r is um, and this should not be here so let me go ahead this shouldn't be an equal to here this should just be um less than sign so i'm gonna go ahead and erase that right quick all right so as long as our values of r are in between negative one and one um, then we know that the corresponding geometric sequence is going to be convergent and it's going to be divergent for all other uh, values of R there. So if we were to um, phrase that another way, we would say that the limit of this geometric sequence as n approaches infinity or the behavior in which this particular sequence acts as the values of n get larger and larger, um, of course, it will converge to um, what is it, zero here if it's in between negative one to one. Um, in the case of when n is actually, uh, well, in the case when r is equal to 1, um, then of course it'll always be 1. And um, of course it'll be divergent everywhere else. 
And so, um, I'm, yeah, I remember that's the reason why I had this equal to here because um, of the case of whenever you just have one race at the end, no matter what n is going to be, um, more than likely it's just going to go to one because you just got a you know bunch of <laughs> you just got a bunch of ones being listed one right after the other. Okay. All right, so let's uh, look at an example here. So if we consider the sequence um, one third raised to the n, uh, because this is uh, some common uh, ratio, we know that it's a geometric sequence. Okay? Uh, we also know that this uh, geometric sequence um, will actually converge because of the fact that R is in between uh, negative one and one, okay? And when I say converge, and, and I need to clarify this here, um, when I say uh, converge here, of course, um, I'm talking about in the sense of it converging to zero because you know, most geometric sequences, if your common ratio or that R is in between negative one to one, it always converges to zero. And most of the times those are the ones that we deal with, okay? Um, in the rare case of us having um, a common ratio of one, um, of course, it converges to one. But like I say, this is it, it's one that pops up, but it's rare. And so the reason why I originally erased that is because 99% of the time we deal with this particular case too, and not necessarily this one, okay? So I wanted to go ahead and clarify that. So here, since um, R is equal to one third, it's going to be in between negative one to one. Then we know um, that it's going that this geometric uh, sequence is going to converge by basic fact number six, which is just me stating all this here. Okay, so therefore, uh, without having to do much else, uh, we know that the limit of one third raised to the um, n is going to go to zero. Okay, now we didn't really need to state all this stuff <laughs> to know that. Um, if you use your pre-calculus knowledge and first year calculus knowledge, you'll know that this particular limit goes to zero here, okay? So provided that, and, and I'll show you how easy this actually is, and let me do this in a different color. So provided that um, we know that this sequence is going to follow the same type of uh, behavior and profile as its corresponding uh, continuous function, we could say limit as x approaches infinity of one third raised to the x. And here we have to remember that one third raised to the x is the same as three raised to the negative x. Or um, putting it another way, we know that this is an exponentially decreasing function. So uh, exponentially decreasing function as the value of values of x approach infinity is going to naturally go to zero just because of the way that um, an exponentially decreasing function looks. Okay, And so um, if you remember what your basic um, algebraic graphs look like from pre-cal, um, this particular basic fact, we don't necessarily need to, to have to memorize and you know, state all this fancy stuff here uh, because of the fact that you know, we'll, we'll know it anyway, okay? All right, so um, in contrast here, this next example, we want to consider this sequence. And of course, this sequence is also a geometric sequence, but it's one where the common ratio is outside of this range of being in between negative one and one, where one is included. Of course, uh, because four thirds is higher than one, then this is this essentially follows the same profile of four thirds raised to the x, which we know that is an exponentially increasing function. So as x approaches infinity here, the y values are going to go to infinity as well. So because of that, the limit does not exist because the limit will be infinity. And thus, that particular uh, geometric sequence will diverge. OK, so the next thing that is important to us is now 
uh, being able to identify special types of sequences um, that are essentially always increasing or always decreasing. Okay, And in short, any sequence um, or list of numbers where we list the numbers and they are um, steadily increasing the more we list or they're steadily decreasing the more we list in general are called um, monotonic sequences. Okay. And so um, I've, I've written a lot of stuff here, but in general, uh, that's all it really is. If we have a sequence whose um, individual numbers as we list more and more of them increases in value or decreases in value, we consider those to be um, a monotonic sequence. Monotonic just means that it always does one thing. There is no you know, going back and forth. Okay. All right. So. Uh, with that being said, let's look at this first example here. So we know that this particular sequence of uh, 4 divided by n plus 1 is always decreasing, um, mainly because, of course, if we look at this denominator here, um, as we put in higher values of n, um, our denominator is going to get bigger, which means that our in our actual number 4 divided by that is going to be small. So for instance, if I was to plug in 1 in for n, I would have 4 divided by 2. If I was to plug in 2 for n, I would have 4 divided by 3. If I was to plug in uh, 3 for n, I would have 4 divided by 4. And of course, um, 4 divided by 2, which is 2, is larger than 4 over 3, which is like 1 and 1 third or 1.3 decimal course, which is larger than 4 divided by 4, which is 1. So we see in this case, the sequence is always decreasing. Okay, And thus, uh, this would be an example of a monotonic sequence. Okay, Now, uh, the sequence n divided by n plus 1 is always increasing for the same reasons. If I was to plug in a 1 right here, then this would be 1 half. If I was to plug in a 2, right here, then I would have, um, let's say a two right here, rather, then I would have um, two divided by two plus one, which is two thirds. And if, let's say I did it one more time, it would be three divided by four, okay? So here, one half is smaller than two thirds, which is smaller than three fourths, okay? So the idea here is that if that's the case, then for every value n divided by n plus one, if we added one value, added the values of n by one, this result would always be larger than this one, okay? So therefore, um, it has this property and our sequence is what's considered increasing. And again, since it is increasing, we know that uh, this particular sequence would be considered to be monotonic, okay? Now, we need to talk about um, what's called a bounded sequence. Okay? Um, naturally, whenever we talk about um, sequences that are always increasing or decreasing, thus they're monotonic, um, we have to talk about, well, what is the number that is going to um, bound the sequence above or below? Okay? And so here, a sequence is going to be bounded above um, if there exists at least uh, some number, and we're just going to call it big M, such that any number in the sequence that we have uh, does not get larger than this particular number here. Okay, And that's for all values of, of N uh, that can be used. Okay, So they're basically 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 going on moving forward. So a sequence is called bounded below if there exists at least some number, we'll call it little m, for where any number in the sequence um, is not getting below this number, okay? So another way of putting that is that every number in the sequence um, will be larger than, or at the very minimum, equal to this particular number here, okay? And of course, basic fact number seven says that if we um, have a bounded and monotonic sequence, 
um, every one of those is going to be convergent, okay? So every single bounded monotonic sequence is convergent. So if we put that in other words, um, any sequence that has a, a number that um, in it that it can't go above, or there's a number in it that every number in the sequence does not go below, and it's either always increasing or always de decreasing, then we know automatically that particular sequence is going to be convergent, okay? And so we don't have to do any fancy, you know, taking the limit of the function test to be able to do all of that, okay? All right, so let's look at some examples here. So we want to determine whether the following sequences are going to be increasing, decreasing, or not monotonic at all, okay? And I word it like that because um, if a sequence is monotonic, then it's either going to be one that's going to be increasing or it's going to be decreasing. Okay. Um, there's no other choices. Okay. <laughs> so for this first sequence here, and let me, I think I forgot the little set braces there. So for this first sequence here, um, we do see that because of the fact that um, we have this negative two in here and we're raising it to a power. Um, it does have like a alternating sign sequence type thing goes and going into it because I can actually express this this way using my exponential rules. Uh, this would actually be something to this effect. And of course, uh, because of the fact that uh, we have the alternating uh, signs going on there, uh, we wouldn't consider this function to be uh, increasing and we wouldn't consider it to be decreasing either, okay? So uh, this is one where it's just going to be not monotonic, okay, uh, for that reason, because it keeps on bouncing back and forth, okay? So we also see here that if we were to uh, take the limit of this particular sequence, um, because it's alternating, I would have to strip out the alternating sign part. And that's, I do that by doing the absolute value of um, the algebraic version of the sequence, which, which ends up being this. And um, of course here, if you think about it, uh, this has a corresponding, well, this sequence has a corresponding continuous function value of two raised to the X plus one. And this is just an exponentially increasing function here. So as um, x approaches infinity, the y values of this function approach infinity as well. So that means the sequence is going to follow suit. And of course, I kind of took the long way to do it, but at the end of the day, it still goes to infinity. So therefore, um, I could also say by taking the limit of the absolute value of this function or basic fact number four, that this particular sequence would not be convergent, okay? And since it's not convergent, then of course I know it's not going to be bounded um, either, okay? All right, so example B, um, a, a much cleaner, better example. So for uh, this example, we have this sequence of numbers that can be characterized by one divided by uh, two n plus three. Um, as we list these numbers here, what you're starting to see is that um, all the numbers after one fifth are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So because of that, we know that um, there is no number in the sequence that will go above this one. So that means that this sequence is going to be bounded above by one fifth. So that's the highest number in the sequence, okay? Now, the other thing is that uh, we also see that, um, of course, these numbers get smaller and smaller and smaller. So we know that this particular sequence is decreasing too. So the sequence is decreasing and the sequence is bounded above. So these two things work together to basically say that um, this particular sequence here, um, which of course is this, 
um, it will be convergent. Okay, so that means that this particular sequence is converging upon some number. Okay, in this case, um, the number that it will converge upon as n approaches infinity would be zero because um, if we took the limit as n approaches infinity of this. Of course, um, in pre-cal language, this just says, hey, does this particular uh, function have um, an n behavior? And of course, uh, we know for rational functions, um, the n behavior, in this case, where we have the degree of the numerator being smaller than a degree of the denominator, or some of you call this um, the function is bottom heavy, we know that it will go to zero. Okay. All right, so let's look at example C. So we have uh, this particular sequence. And for this one, um, it's, not, it's not as straightforward um, to see you know, if this is going to be a sequence that's going to be convergent or not. Okay? Uh, in other words, trying to fit it into the um, definitions of every bounded monotonic sequence. Okay, so we need to check to see, hey, is it going to be bounded? Is it going to be monotonic? Or put another way, um, is our sequence going to be one that always increases, always decreases? And of course, there's, is there some uh, number that every number in the sequence doesn't go above or doesn't go below? Okay, now for this one, uh, since just by looking at it, we can't tell whether this particular sequence is always going to be um, increasing or decreasing. Um, we may not want to list out, you know, the terms of this uh, because, again, we know rational functions kind of act crazy. So we don't want to just assume that just because we list some numbers is just going to uh, follow that. So um, what I do here is I look at the actual continuous function counterpart and I say well hey can I figure out for uh, values of x that are going to be let's say in this case uh, greater than one is this function going to be um, increasing or not okay or decreasing or not okay now to do that I could just find the derivative so um, here if I take the derivative of this function and that is what I'm doing here. So, of course, that's the quotient rule. So um, I'm applying the quotient rule here, simplifying. And I see that this is the result that I get whenever I do that. And since 17 is positive and 3x plus 4 squared also has to always be positive uh, because um, it's squared and it's in the denominator, then we know that our derivative is always going to be positive, which means that our original function here is always increasing, okay? So um, because of that, we know that the corresponding sequence, the 2n minus 3 divided by 3n plus 4, that is also going to be always increasing as well, okay? So f of x, the continuous time counterpart is an increasing function. So that means that um, this is also going to be increasing as well. And so now, um, of course, I'm just doing the limit here just to you know kind of show you that because of the fact that, um, of course, this is always increasing, um, if we take the limit as x approaches zero of our sequence, we see that it converges upon some number. And of course that number is two thirds. And uh, what that tells us is that uh, the more we list these numbers um, in, the, in the particular sequence, uh, 2n minus three divided by 3n um, plus four, um, I don't know, <laughs> this should be a plus right here. So when I list uh, those numbers there, I know that they are going to be increasing, but they're not going to go beyond this particular number here. Okay. So by basic fact number one, um, and that just that's basically just saying that the behavior of this particular function, uh, the behavior of uh, the two x minus three divided by three x plus four, 
Um, however that acts, I know that this corresponding sequence here is going to act the same way. So that's what basic fact number one is. So by basic fact number one, we know that the behavior of the sequence is going to follow the same behavior as this corresponding continuous function. Okay. Now, here I've actually gone through the, the trouble of actually starting to list these numbers here. And so um, what we see is that in listing these numbers, um, these numbers tend um, to get larger. But of course, we see that the, the number that none of those numbers in the sequence will go below is a negative one set. Okay. And of course, if we kept on listing numbers, uh, the number that it won't go above is going to be two thirds. Okay. So we know just by listing the numbers that um, the sequence is going to be monotonic. Um, because of that, we, we by default, it's going to be increasing as well. And we know that it's going to be bounded below by this particular number. Now, of course, I didn't write this here, but it's also going to be bounded above uh, by two thirds. OK. But the thing is, I just need to know that it's either bounded above or below. Don't necessarily have to show both. As long as I have one, I'm good. All right. So this concludes the second video in the video series on uh, reviewing sequences uh, for use in calculus. So the part three video that I'm going to do uh, this will be the video where I actually go in and do some of uh, some you know live examples um, doing things such as um, we're going to you know take a sequence and, and list you know first couple of terms of it um, we'll kind of go backwards and say well hey uh, here is a list of numbers can you form that into some sequence in an algebraic form so we'll you know, do some things like that. Um, and of course, the main thing is once we're able to do that, um, can we take that algebraic form of the sequence and show whether that particular sequence is going to converge or diverge? And, and again, um, all this is important because we're eventually going to use uh, sequences in some shape, form or fashion to help us to be able to express functions that we can't find the most general antiderivative of using um, the techniques that you learn in a first or second year calculus course um, to, be, to be able to do it. So we're trying to es essentially find a way to rewrite these, these functions that we have to find the antiderivative of as a polynomial so that we could just take the antiderivative of the corresponding polynomial that is going to um, either approximate or match up with the actual function that we need to deal with exactly. Okay. All right. So I'll see you in that part three video. Take care.